Wow, uh, I guess it can only go uphill from there. Um, so greetings and thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Is this okay? Cool. Uh, thanks to the HOPE organizers for, for having me to do this talk. Also to Greg for his uh, great talk prior to this one, which uh, overlaps with mine in some, some nice ways. Uh, so the title is Obfuscation and its Discontents. DIY privacy from card swap to browser hack. Um, I'm going to present obfuscation as an expressive technology. I'll say what that means in a second. Um, primarily, I'm going, to, I'm going to do that through a series of examples. Uh, and these are also art-like projects, similar to uh, a bit similar to what Greg was doing. Uh, but first, I want to do a little uh, historical detour as a way of approaching uh, this idea, so please bear with me here for a moment, another moment. Uh, so in a recent talk at Columbia, uh, Eben Moglen traced the current trend toward a, sur a total surveillance state back to the very violent period of the Roman Empire in the first century BC, when control by Emperor Augustus was nearly absolute. Um, there was some lip service paid to uh, ideas like freedom, but there was little, little toleration of dissent. Um, because the Roman Empire was so vast, there was nowhere for dissenters to hide. It was, as, as Mogollon uh, cites, fatal to resist and impossible to fly. Um, but he tells us that Augustus's vast power rested not primarily on military might, though that played a part, but rather on his control of communications. Uh, specifically along the trading routes near and far from Rome. Uh, he says that in the administration of power, Augustus was the best informed human being in the history of the world, and that he used this power in large part to eradicate human freedom. Uh, perhaps similarly to the situation in the U.S. after 9-11, when those in power uh, in the U.S. abandoned what Moglen refers to as the morality of freedom. Uh, Augustus vast, vastly increased the power of the emperor in relation to the Senate, uh, the Roman Senate. Uh, and this in included, interestingly, appointing himself censor of Rome, which gave him the power, among others, to supervise public morality. And in this first century BC, when, when Augustus took control, this was also the peak of Roman imperialism. By the end of his reign, uh, armies had conquered, his armies had conquered Spain and Portugal, and uh, what is today Spain and Portugal and Switzerland, Bavaria, Austria, Slovenia, Albania, Croatia, Hungary, Serbia, and even extended the borders of uh, uh, the Africa provinces uh, to the east and south. It's not supposed to start yet. Um, but in, in, in the years uh, just before Augustus took control, there was a series of slave rebellions uh, called the Servile Wars, uh, the third of which was somewhat long-lasting and, and uh, documented in the uh, well-known 1960 film called Spartacus, uh, which was uh, directed by none other than uh, Stanley Kubrick, um, and which I'll show a clip of in a moment. Uh, but the film, uh, you, you sort of need to understand the political climate of the US in the 40s and, and 50s, um, which was uh, during the second Red Scare um, uh, in Hollywood and, and the larger country. Okay, so this was uh, the height of McCarthyism, where artists and intellectuals thought to be associated with communism were hauled before Congress to inform on friends and colleagues. Uh, and in fact, the scriptwriter for the Star Spartacus film was Dalton Trumbo, one of the f uh, famous Hollywood Ten, um, a group of writers and directors who were called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities in 1947. Uh, but they all refused to cooperate uh, and then were blacklisted uh, the scriptwriter Trumbo, who you see here, uh, was then jailed, among others, for uh, contempt of Congress. The author of the Spartacus novel in which the film uh, was based, Howard Fast, 
was also called before the committee a bit later in 1950 when he refused to disclose the names of contributors to a fund for orphans of American veterans of the Spanish Civil War. And then he was also jailed. Uh, it was in jail that he began to work on the novel that would become Spartacus, uh, which was then, of course, blacklisted by all the major publishing houses, and he was forced to self-publish it after his release. Um, nonetheless, the film was eventually made, um, and after the release, amidst some controversy, uh, producer uh, Kirk Douglas, a uh, producer and star Kirk Douglas, announced publicly that the blacklisted Trumbo was the screenwriter. Um, uh, and, and then later, President Kennedy uh, caught, crossed the picket lines to see the film, uh, which, which uh, sort of signaled the uh, gradual end of blacklisting uh, in, in Hollywood, um, probably due mostly to the massive profits the film generated. Um, I think it was the largest grossing film ever at that time and, and continued to be uh, to hold that position for 10 more years at least um, till it was displaced by airport, I believe. Um, so we go from imperialism and total uh, totalitarian rule enabled in some large part by signal intelligence to slavery, McCar McCarthyism, and the morality or lack thereof uh, associated with freedom uh, in in uh, the U.S. So we now uh, can come to this clip from Spartacus, which I think provides a really nice illustration of obfuscation, which is the topic uh, t today. So let's see if I can get this to play. Have we a count of prisoners? We haven't made the final count, sir. I bring a message from your master, Marcus Licinius Crassus, commander of Italy. By command of his most merciful excellency, your lives are to be spared. Slaves you were, and slaves you remain. But the terrible penalty of crucifixion has been set aside on the single condition that you identify the body or the living person of the slave called Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. emotions at all. Okay. Uh, so here's the definition of obfuscation that, that I'm going to use. Uh, the production, inclusion, addition, or communication of misleading, ambiguous, or false data in an effort to evade, distract, or confuse data gatherers. Data gatherers. Okay. Uh, that's from uh, Brunton and Nissenbaum in, in a 2011 paper. Um, and, and now that we have that little historical background in place, we can look at some uh, specific examples, uh, many of which span an interesting line between uh, technological solutions, political commentary, and art projects, um, an idea that I'll come back to. So here's the first one. I don't know if people know this work. Uh, it's called I Like What I See uh, by Steve Kleiss in 2012. Uh, it's a recent, uh, well, 2012 browser hack that uses obfuscation to confuse 
the collection of personal data on Facebook. So I like what I see is a Chrome extension to automatically click all like links on Facebook. <laughs> when you visit Facebook, click the thumbs up in the extension bar and start scrolling and liking, liking and scrolling. Every instance of the word like will be clicked. Don't worry, Facebook is a fun place full of all the stuff you like. <laughs> and that's, that's actually the, the, re, uh, the markdown readme file from GitHub where I, I grabbed that. Um, uh, so, and while the language is, is tongue in cheek here, the problem explored is, is of course familiar to everyone and serious, uh, specifically the aggregation of personal data by third party service providers, in this case Facebook, into databases which can then be traded, sold, uh, potentially stolen, used for all kinds of nefarious behavior, violating privacy um, in many cases, and even assisting those who'd like to create a, a state of total surveillance similar to that which Augustus enjoyed in Rome. Uh, Snowden, of course, revealed for us how the NSA uses tracking cookies issued by service providers like Google to assist in their uh, surveillance activities. And, and one of the things this, this piece does is highlight a tension between specific human values, uh, between our desire to share with each other on the one hand and to maintain privacy on the other. Uh, of course, people like uh, Zuckerberg or Eric Schmidt want us to think that these two values are mutually exclusive, uh, but we can quickly realize that there are no technical or logical reasons why this should be so. Uh, besides the massive profits generated by the companies telling us this. Uh, so this is a, a simple case, uh, of course, but uh, the larger argument and one of the assumptions of this talk is that technical artifacts software can represent or embed specific political questions and agendas, uh, and they are ways of uh, th these could be ways of arguing about who gets a voice in determining future directions uh, for society. Um, skip this slide there. Uh, so, so in addition to talking about how, how um, I like what I see pollutes Facebook's logs, we can also consider the arguments it makes as a cultural artifact. Um, again, um, uh, referencing uh, Greg's talk earlier, uh, as we might, uh, with, a, with a piece of writing or an art installation that we view. Which is to say that uh, some of these works, and I'll show a bunch, uh, several of them next, uh, have both functional and expressive properties that we can consider. Uh, so before we do that, let's uh, go back a few years to the project on which uh, I like what I see was modeled. And this work was called Track Me Not and was about privacy in the context of web, web search. Uh, it was released in 2006, soon after AOL released its anonymized search records, which were then quickly de-anonymized by researchers, resulting in a small scandal. Uh, AOL eventually apologized, but this, what this told the larger population was that searches can reveal a great deal of personal and private information about people, most of whom uh, weren't even aware that such data was being collected uh, and stored. I'm not sure how many people remember this um, um, back in 2006, but it was a, a small, big deal. Um, so what uh, so what Track Me Not does is to notice where and when you search for things, say at Google or Bing or Baidu, and then to start sending fake uh, but realistic seeming queries to their servers at intervals around the original, uh, hiding your real interest, um, protecting. Uh, yourself and potentially others and polluting the engine's logs um, and, and polluting the engine's uh, uh, search logs. So and after the simple, uh, after a simple proto prototype re was released, there were several iterations adding new features like dynamic query lists from live data sources, strategies to defeat timing and side channel attacks. Uh, most recently there was a uh, a Department of Home Se Homeland Security feature added uh, that you could opt into to inc include trigger words um, from this list uh, in all your fake searches that TrackMeNot is issuing. 
So Beyond Working is a tool to hide user interests and defeat targeted advertising. Track Me Not has also has these expressive elements. Uh, the once rather disempowered user is provided with uh, some small bit of a voice, a means of registering their dissatisfaction with those who run uh, these massive and opaque technical systems. And they do that by literally scrawling their dissatisfaction over the search engine logs. Um, to arguably uh, um, the most valuable asset that search engines keep. So um, besides generating lots of controversy, some of which I'll talk in a second, it was the start of two things in my own work, one being a type of project I like to call artware, which is a mix of software tool and art project, and the other being the use of this strategy uh, we call obfuscation, which of course is not a new idea, uh, this is a non-digital example of obfuscation dating back to World War II uh, when m metallized material was dropped from planes in order to flood radar screens with false positives. Another non-digital example of obfuscation, again for privacy, this one was mentioned in the title, uh, is loyalty card swapping. Uh, which was popular for a while as a way to confuse uh, retail um, purchase databases. There was even a site called cardexchange.com that facilitated swaps between strangers, uh, and one pr proponent sent out his uh, UPC for, from, from his card on a sticker, um, this is the right side image above there, um, to any and all takers for their use. So if you sent him an email, he would send you back uh, the sticker, and he was hoping to amass the greatest single shopping profile of all time. <laughs> <laughs> but even in these simple examples, we can find potential for harm, like the case above where a father found out from Target that his daughter was pregnant, or the court case cited by uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, involving a customer who slipped and was injured in a supermarket, and then the market tried in the court case to use purchase data, to use his purchase data, specifically his alcohol purpose, uh, purchases, to suggest he was likely impaired at the time of the fall. <laughs> um, so here's another. Um, uh, little software, um, obfuscating software um, example. Uh, Cash Cloak uh, applies the concept of obfuscation to, to uh, GPS data that's collected by mobile phone providers. So instead of sending only requests for data on the user's, user's actual path, it sends requests for a number of different but plausible paths related to the current location, then presents the user only with the results they need for their actual path. Um, and so, so that was a, a relatively recent piece, I'm not sure of the year. Uh, the Pirate Bay also uses obfuscation, or, or has at some point, um, to deter anti-privacy organizations. So what these organizations would do is to generate requests to trackers um, for peers and then and for a list of peers and then log the IP addresses and then send takedown notices. Uh, so versions of the uh, Pirate Bay's tracker software were developed that automatically inserted a number of random uh, peer IP addresses into the list, then uh, thus providing all the users of the of the network with a sort of plausible deniability. Um, you know, my IP is only in there because it was one of the fake ones. We do it on time. Okay. Uh, another one uh, called uh, Scare Mail, um, and and this adds to all your emails when you enable it. Algorithmically generated narratives built primarily from the trigger words that are tracked by the NSA, and this puts this at the bottom of your actual email. Um, I unfortunately, don't have any examples of those narratives, but they're sometimes quite funny. Uh, that was a piece by Ben Grosser, um, I think, this year or last year. Okay, so now on to the discontents, um, and then I'll finish up with uh, one very new project which we're about to release hopefully later this month. Um, so 
As I mentioned, Track Me Not initially generated quite a bit of controversy when, when the soft, while the software was downloaded over one million times in the first year, many critics, especially in the security community, were rather hostile to the approach. And these criticisms generally broke down uh, into two camps. Uh, functional critiques, uh, arguing that it doesn't uh, work to, to uh, protect you um, or to dilute your profile, and ethical critiques, which argue that it was in some way immoral. So uh, I'll talk about the TMN case here, tr uh, track me not case here, but similar arguments have been put forth against most of the other projects that use obfuscation. Uh, track me not was just the first, um, but these uh, range from legal attacks to the types uh, of uh, side channel attacks that are uh, listed above there, um, usually uh, being based on three uh, uh, different properties of the software, one being the, the types of queries it um, generates, the other being the timing of those queries that are generated, and then the third being side channel attacks, information leaked by the browser, incorrect headers, um, the fact that early versions didn't use the uh, text suggestion bar to type in uh, the queries, um, click-throughs on search results, things like that, active content, uh, uh, they, if a JavaScript file, for example, wasn't downloaded by the plugin, that would be a, a hint to the search engine that it wasn't an actual query. Um, the larger question, of course, is whether such noise, if when injected into uh, tracking databases of various kinds, actually matters for the kind of data mining being done. And of course, this is um, difficult to say without actually knowing what techniques are being used um, by search engines uh, and of course this info is is carefully guarded um, and not released but uh, we do know that noise consumes significant resources uh, for data mi for data miners uh, there's a recent quote stating that 80 percent of the time spent on data mining, sometimes more, is spent on cleaning, preparing the data, removing the noise, etc. Um, this is a similar uh, uh, bit of research, um, percent of, of project time spent on uh, removing noise and, and uh, data cleaning. So even if some or perhaps all of the noise by different implementations uh, can eventually be filtered out by search engines, uh, one thing we, need to cons we would need to consider is the time and resources that they have to invest in order to do that. Uh, and so we can, uh, if anyone wants to discuss the technical details um, of any of those implementations, uh, happy to do so in the Q&A if I can uh, get through these last uh, two sections. Um, but also many of the articles were, uh, sorry, many of the critiques were ethical ones. Uh, and they, they um, I've broken down some of them here. Um, Dishonesty, a sort of Kantian argument that it's a, it's a form of uh, lying, which is uh, misrepresenting your, yourself, which is always, uh, it's always wrong. Um, uh, free riding, that you're breaking the free web, uh, or that others will have to uh, pay the price for your um, avoidance of these, uh, say, ads or um, marketing opportunities which support um, so-called free uh, content. Uh, and finally, waste, pollution, and system damage, which uh, was very, um, many critiques focused on this. You're all waste, uh, the program is wasting b bandwidth, it's wasting uh, storage, uh, and then the sort of um, a cumulative critique that says, if everyone did this, the, universe, uh, the, the internet wouldn't work anymore. Um, maybe that's what happened in this room earlier. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, these were uh, addressed in some depth, uh, were addressed somewhat in the original paper we wrote about uh, Track Me Not and addressed much more deeply in 
um, a political philosophy of obfuscation. Uh, this was a 2011 paper by Brunton and Nissenbaum again. Okay, so lastly, um, I'll talk about, I wanna leave a little time for Q&A. Uh, I'll talk about a very recent project uh, which hasn't even been publicly released yet, and this is called Ad Nauseam, uh, also with Helen Nissenbaum, and the design you see here by uh, Mushan Zeraviv. And here we're applying the concepts of obfuscation to the ad networks that track us over the web. So how we do this is by first blocking all the ads, similar to the way in which an ad blocker works, and then in the background, uh, clicking on all the ads. So every single ad on every page that you visit will be clicked in the background by the software. Vi it will be visited in the background by the software. And so uh, it also presents you uh, with a sort of collage uh, of the ads you would have seen had you been seeing ads. Um, and uh, sort of presents, which I'll come back to, a, a, a picture of what your profile in the ad networks looks like, which most people don't have, or I at least don't have a good idea of. Okay. So what are, what are the objectives of, of this piece? Um, uh, three things, or three and a half things. Uh, protection, expression, subversion, and surveillance. Um, as uh, Greg mentioned earlier. So first, the protections uh, are kind of obvious. The, you, your uh, true interests are hidden um, because you are clicking on everything uh, and your data profile is, uh, is, noise, uh, is, is diluted with noise. Uh, so subversion, uh, so this is talking uh, uh, at least partially about the system level, right? We're introducing distrust between advertisers and ad networks, right? Advertisers um, are paying ad networks to display ads, um, and yet uh, no humans in this case are seeing the ads, um, and so there's now tension between these two parties which potentially or there's potentially tension, uh, which there was not uh, before. Uh, and lastly, expression, which I mentioned before. Uh, it amplifies the voices of those with little power in this, uh, in this system, uh, who uh, are able to, again, write their dissatisfaction across the logs and databases of the system that they're basically forced to use by um, by uh, navigating the web. And then uh, surveillance um, is this, uh, that's actually the wrong so slide, but it's more like this slide, um, is this idea of watching the watchers. Um, so here we get uh, this sort of collage-like view of what the watcher, um, uh, the profile that they have, that they imagine is ours. Okay. It's a sort of, it's, I'm not quite sure whether that's a real case of surveillance, but it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, so um, obfuscation as a strategy, does this make sense? So here are some positive uh, things to think about. It's a quick and dirty solution. Uh, to potentially thorny problems. Uh, many of these browser add-on hacks were uh, qu quite quickly developed in a few hours or a couple of days by a single coder, and they can comment quickly on current events. Uh, they're often um, quite understandable to, not, to non technical people, which I think is important. They tell an easy story that uh, people understand. So in, compared to some, in comparison to something like Tor, which is, of course, uh, great for its purposes, uh, non-technical users get these ideas uh, immediately. They understand the basic workings because they're simple, and uh, they can then be ad uh, adopted much more widely. 
um, power asymmetries, uh, you know, th these provide a, a, a voice for people without, um, without much power in these uh, dynamics with large companies uh, that they didn't have before. Um, and of course, um, there's the uh, community element of it in the sense that you're often polluting a database um, larger sort of uh, metrics that, that can be derived from a database uh, across users. Um, whoops. So, um, and maybe, maybe obfuscation is only a technique we'd, or a strategy we'd want to use when others are not feasible. Um, so some of the others that are suggested are listed here at the bottom. Uh, opting out, of course. Um, we may have the option to opt out of some of these systems, uh, but this is um, becoming less and less of an option as governments and um, sort of necessary services start to uh, work in this way. Corporate um, sort of self-policing uh, is probably hopeless. Uh, as there's little incentive for them to do better, their core business is collecting and selling personal data that they, um, which, which they're gathering without any real informed consent, but it's making them a ton of money. <clears throat> regulation, government uh, regulation um, is a potentially longer term solution, but again, depending on the countries, uh, governments are closely linked to business and also have the added agenda of uh, benefiting from surveillance uh, possibilities. Um, technically, there are certainly longer term solutions here as well, but they often involve uh, things like standards and a range of different stakeholders, often with conflicting goals. Uh, the utter failure that was the do not track initiative being a good example of that. So uh, lastly, uh, so open questions for thinking about obfuscation. Uh, is it a viable if short-term technical strategy that we can use ethically along with other strategies like encryption, uh, distributed um, social systems, opting out, et cetera? What kind of guarantees can obfuscation systems actually provide in terms of privacy? Uh, and what types of adversarial systems have been developed to thwart attempts at obfuscation. And there's, uh, we're working on some um, research to answer the second and third uh, questions uh, here. So uh, I'm gonna stop there and hopefully we leave um, 10, or, 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A if people have things they'd like to ask. So uh, thanks a lot. Okay, so the, the question was, uh, in the case of ad nauseum, how, do the requ how does the system make requests to these uh, advertising, um, uh, or to the ads, and then what do they do with the data that they get back? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so basically ad nauseum was built on top of uh, ad block plus, right? So that enabled us to, um, identify all the ads on a page and then remove them, right, hide them. Either by not requesting them or by requesting them, downloading them, and then making them invisible. Okay, so now we have uh, the URLs for all of these ads um, and we load in 
uh, we, we simulate a click on each of these in a hidden browser window. Okay, the hidden browser window then downloads the content um, that you would have seen if you had clicked on it in your, uh, in your browser and uh, including uh, resources like JavaScript and Flash and whatever else, images, and then um, once it's downloaded, that stuff is all thrown away. Is there an understanding of any for the effect of the paperclip model that I think Yeah, there is, uh, uh, I should have put that in the talk. There was um, some uh, critiques uh, early on in this project that this was a form of click fraud. Yes. Um, <laughs> that was uh, what you're getting at. Um, in our discussions with lawyers, it seems that, and I'm not sh very sure of the details, but it seems that uh, click fraud implies some, um, what was the word you say? Targeting. Yeah, it avoids targeting and it also avoid, uh, involves uh, financial gain, uh, right? Fraud involves... Um, I think that the, that was the line of the argument. Uh, the result was that this wouldn't fall legally under the under the um, category of click fraud, but that doesn't mean that certainly won't stop people from uh, making that argument. Right, thank you. So, sorry. Oh. Go ahead. I was just wondering, and you just mentioned AdBlock Plus. Mm. What made you initially? instead of avoiding ads or avoiding, like I was going to ask you about, now there's several search engines that supposedly act as like a proxy between you and Google and being like privately or start page or duck, duck, go. Like right. What do you think and, and where do you, about their efficacy, one, and two, like which side of the coin do you think is more use or helpful to the end user, avoiding or just flooding as with ads, like avoiding like Adblock Plus or, you know, Adblock Plus can also block all those Facebook like buttons or let me just click on everything and try to corrupt their database as much as possible. Right. I mean, there's certainly two different strategies, um, both of which well, both of which I use. <laughs> you can do both. Um, the problem with these uh, sites like DuckDuckGo and, s and such is you're basically placing a sort of blind trust in another third party. So while I feel better about DuckDuckGo uh, than I do about Google, I don't really have any guarantees that I should, you know, that that's accurate. Um, well, you can't actually do both as far as the ads are, you're either avoiding them or you're clicking on all of them. So what was your desire to sort of not avoid them but just sort of click on all of them? Like what was that initial concept? I'm, I'm getting confused between the search engine case and the ad case. Well, uh, I was asking about both, but just you said I use both. I mean, I, I yeah. use DuckDuckGo sometimes, but I mean, in my experience, the search results you get from DuckDuckGo are often uh, Subpar, yeah. Um, maybe that will change over time, hopefully. Um, but and then when I do search for Google, I'll use some kind of obfuscating. Uh, you know, there are also other uh, ways of keeping your uh, data out of a profile. So you can make dummy accounts and etc. But with browser fingerprinting, uh, many of those are are not going to work very well at all. Do you use the user agent switching? Yeah. Uh, wait, let me. Sorry. When you're using public computers, uh, you, have, you have an answer for that. And also, the autofill option with fake data in that. Autofill. I want to populate a uh, password and fill all that stuff. Turn that feature on, but it will probably make the network so much turning it off. You need to make sure that if there's the hidden forms, it will populate it, even though it drives the like an idea for a new. A new plugin that would do this? Submit forms on that. I think that'd be cool. <laughs> I think such things have been at least attempted. Um, 
Uh, in pub uh, well, sometimes you can install software on public um, computers, things like Tails or whatever, but uh, if you're on a public computer and you're not signed in, then it's not your profile anyway. So it's not. Uh, let me just check. I can't really see back there. Yeah, I have a question. Sure, so I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, one of the top items was Right. Do you know of any uh, experimental evidence to describe the various? Yeah. So as I said, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Uh, so as I said, I was. Um, we're working on some of that now, but there's a, an excellent paper that exists. Uh, let me see if I can find it here, uh, in which six of these query obfuscators are evaluated against model adversaries uh, with uh, machine learning classifiers. Uh, trying to distinguish between real and fake, and they have varying degrees of success with each of them. Uh, let me just see if I can find the reference here. Yeah, uh, so it's Balsa, Troncoso, and Diaz, and the paper is called Obfuscation Based Private Web Search, uh, and they look at six different, six different, uh, track me not, and five different sub subsequent implementations by other people. Thank you. Did you say that again? The name of the paper is Obfuscation-Based Private Web Search, and the authors are Balsa, Troncoso, and Diaz. Right, and then so the ad networks will say that. Yeah. Or the, you said the advertisers. The the ad network slash the advertisers are paying. Right. The ad networks are going to be making quite a bit of money. Off right. So the ad networks are initially quite happy. Oh my gosh, we're getting all these uh, new clicks. The advertisers who have to pay for all these new clicks, which no one has actually seen. Um, are less happy, and that's what I was saying about introducing this, sorry, uh, tensions between various parties in this system with uh, the potential for uh, subverting it in some way, right? Because those, those two entities are very, uh, very much on the same side at this point. So what do you think will happen? Uh, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> you don't know if it's going to subvert it. It just something will happen. Yeah, something will happen. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's sort of the interesting thing about some of these more artistic uh, kind of, because I think of this as an art project, even though it's software. Um, uh, you know, it's not like we're trying to solve a specific problem, but part of it is tr we're trying to make a statement, we're trying to get, get people th thinking about the issues, um, uh, you know, maybe cause some, some press to be generated about uh, tracking that wasn't generated before, et cetera. I mean, what, um, so, so that implies that you're, you have a malicious ad on a page that you have already visited intentionally. Um, so that's a good question. I, I, we've discussed this in the past, but I don't know what conclusions we came to, how much we can sandbox the, um, the, the downloading at, and potentially running of active content on the page uh, that happens in this hidden browser tag tab, um, but that's a good question. Oh. Next, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't see you at all.
that would be at risk for a line and more ammunition. One or two of those searches happens to match. Uh, so if you're already do, uh, do, uh, attracting the attention of uh, law enforcement, then uh, this would make it worse, is the, is the argument potentially make it worse? Um, I guess that's possible. The, the critique we get more often than that is uh, that for the average person, uh, suddenly you, you find, you know, because the queries are dynamically generated from current events, right? So things like, you know, pipe bomb will show up uh, sometimes. Uh, and we'll get people who are looking for, you know, the newest um, cornbread recipe, you know, ser suddenly s searching for, for pipe, pipe bomb and, and uh, you know, child porn or something. Uh, but but what it also provides, uh, assuming it works correctly, is is plausible deniability in all those cases, right? So you might actually benefit from that because you could say that all these uh, other queries were potentially also generated by Track Me Not. How would who be able to determine? Well, you, I mean, ostensibly, you'd, you'd know what you search for. Well, that's, that's sort of the point. You or and them and, and your adversary would not be able to prove it. Possible. Yeah, so you, you can, not in your browser history, yes, in your browser, in your search history on Google they show up, but they, and they also show up in the logs for Track Me Not, so you, and they actually show up in real time, so you can see them as they're happening in the interface. So in the status bar, you'll see the, the query that was uh, just launched and, and the search engine it's going to. Zero. <laughs> uh, Happy to talk about this more um, outside. Uh, I had my, uh, you can grab me on Twitter if you want. Uh, uh, I can post it. It also has a lot of the references for, for this stuff if you, if you want that, but I can post it. Um, I'll, 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 I'll tweet w um, with, with the link, yeah. Uh, this is my Twitter. Oops, gone. At uh, Daniel C. Howe, if you can remember that. There it is. Feel free to send me a note. Happy to talk about this more. Thanks a lot.